All right, Psalm chapter 99. We're going to continue on in, our, in the series I've been doing on the characteristics of God. And we've got two more characteristics to go over, uh, one this morning and one this afternoon. And this morning, the characteristic of God that we're going to be dealing with is holiness. Holy, we serve a holy God. God is holy. That word holy is used in the Bible, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Uh, not always in reference to just God, but it's a, it's a word that's used a lot. And if you're not exactly sure what, what a holy means, there's, you know, there's, there's a few synonyms and some characteristics of just being holy. Holy means God is set apart. God's like basically in a class all of his own. God is completely separate and separate from everything else. God is holy. He's sanctified and, um, and is completely just above everything. So God being holy, he's pure, he's righteous. And, um, you know, these things kind of go together with holy. Let's look at Psalm 99, uh, verse number three. The Bible says, let them praise thy great and terrible name for it is holy. So here the Bible saying that the name of the Lord is holy. Verse number five, exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool for he is holy. And then down there at verse number nine at the end of the passage, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill for the Lord our God is holy. And this is just one example, one psalm. I mean, three times we're seeing in this psalm that God is holy. The Lord is holy. Holy, we serve a holy God. And then in, uh, if you want to flip over to Psalm 111, you're in Psalm 99 already. Just go forward a few pages to Psalm 111 in verse number 9. The Bible reads, He sent redemption unto His people. He hath commanded His covenant forever. Holy and reverend is His name. Again, just saying that the, the name of the Lord is holy. Holy. You know what? When the name of the Lord is holy, it is something that you should show honor to and dignity and respect. And it's not something that you just throw around. That's why one of the Ten Commandments you know, is not to use the name of the Lord in vain. Why? Because the name of the Lord is holy. God's name is holy. It's not something just to be thrown out as a cuss word. Right? People get mad at something. What do they say? They go, you know, Jesus Christ. And they'll just name the name of our Savior, the name, the name of our God. Because they hurt themselves, they've hurt their finger, they've stubbed their toe, and they just, they just blaspheme the name of Christ by just calling out on his name just without any real intention. We're supposed to reserve the name of God and the name of Jesus to, to, for times when you are speaking to God. For times when you are specifically have a request and you want to call to God, you know, when people say, how about this, oh my God. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, in daily life, oh my God, are you really caring or considering God at all in your statement when you just make that statement, just go, oh my God? Seriously, think about it. Now, I know we're talking about God being holy as an attribute, but just real quick on, on using the name of the Lord in vain, when you're calling out, you know what vain means? Vain means it's meaningless. Vain means it's empty. Vain means there's no reason to be using that expression to be calling on God if you're not actually calling to Him. You know what you'll find in the Psalms? You'll find the phrase, oh my God. But you know what it's in, in reference to and being used as? It's David or whoever the psalmist is going, oh my God, please help me. And he's speaking to God. So there's nothing wrong with the phrase, oh my God, when you're talking to God. There's nothing wrong with using the name of Jesus Christ when you're talking to or about Jesus Christ. But you know what we don't want to do is just get in these habits that the world has, the God-rejecting world of just throwing around these names as if they're meaningless, as if they're not holy, if they, as if they shouldn't be set apart and given regard and given reverence to. The Bible says in Psalm 119 there, holy and reverend is his name. God's name is reverend. You know, this is also another reason why we don't call the pastors or the preachers reverend. We call our preachers, we call them pastors or bishops, whatever the you know, Bible terms. You can use the word minister. 
because they're ministers of God's word. They're serving people, right? Those are all appropriate terms to use. We do not use father because the Bible, as Jesus said, to call no man on earth your father. We don't call him master or rabbi. And we don't call him reverend. Because God's name is reverend, not some man behind a pulpit. I'm not going to go and try to equate myself as being, oh, reverend this and reverend that. I understand there's people who make honest mistakes. Some people have grown up in different churches and, and, and churches that use wrong terms. But I always will correct people on that. And you should, too. If you, when you hear people just, you know, saying, oh, reverend this, you know, you could politely and gently inform them, but let them know, you know, God's name is reverend. We don't, we don't call men reverend. Just like we're not calling him father and we're not, you know. That's reserved for God. And God is a holy God. I don't have it in my notes, but it, we, we went over in, in the book of Joshua. If you remember at the very end of Joshua when he says, you know, you can't serve the God. When I was talking about him being uh, with, with his vengeance and his anger and his fury, right? And that I was talking about his jealousy. And he says, you can't serve the God. You can't serve the Lord because... Um, you know, he's a jealous God, but he also says he's a holy God. So that phrase came up again that he's holy. I mean, he's, he's set apart. He's in a league of his own. So, you know, we need to recognize this about God. And this is just inherent to God being who God is. He is holy. He is set apart. His ways are not our ways. Flip back, if you would, to, or flow forward, excuse me, to Isaiah chapter number 6. As long as you're in the whole Old Testament there, Isaiah chapter 6. This is a key attribute of God, understanding His holiness. One, to help us speak appropriately to God and deal with God in our lives, deal with God personally, understanding He's a holy God. The way that you deal with one another and friends or other relationships that you have with people is on a different level than how you ought to be communicating with and dealing with God because God is holy. God is per God's not your bud, you know, that you can shoot the breeze with and just kind of have these, these flippant conversations or talk about whatever. You know, God is a holy God. And God is to be respected and, and looked up to as being, uh, you know, this essence of perfection and, and holiness. But in Isaiah chapter 6, God is so holy. God, in heaven, God has creatures, beings, creations that, that their job is to just proclaim the holiness of God. That is what they do. To bring glory and honor unto a holy Lord. Look at Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 1. The Bible says, In the year that Uzziah, King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So we see that he sees this vision of, of the Lord just sitting on his throne. He says, And he's high and lifted up. He's exalted. He's in power. Verse 2 Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. So these creatures, these seraphims, they have six wings, and he describes them here. He's got two of the wings are covering his face, two are covering his feet, and two he's flying with. And then it says, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So these creatures are just proclaiming, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. If you want to flip over to Revelation chapter 4, we're going to see something very similar here, another vision of heaven and the way things are being done in heaven for a holy God, in the presence of a holy God. Revelation chapter 4, we're going to start reading in verse number 8. Revelation 4, 8, the Bible reads, And the four beasts 
had each of them six wings about him. Sound familiar? Sounds just like the seraphims. And they were full of eyes within. So this is a little bit extra information we get about their eyes. But look at this. It says, and they rest not day and night. So they're created. They don't, they don't need to get rest. They're not resting. But what are they doing? It says, they rest not day and night saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So John sees another vision in heaven at a much different time than Isaiah saw a vision in heaven, right? All this time, and what's happening in heaven? The same thing. You've got these seraphims going, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And just, and just reverencing the name of the Lord in heaven constantly. That is a holy God. Look at verse number nine. It says, And when the, the, those beasts give honor and glory and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. God is a holy God. And, and we need to remember his holiness regularly and not allow that to just slip our minds as we continue to live in our fleshly bodies here on earth. We serve a holy God. Amen. There, there's a lot of verses because I didn't want to belabor the point of you know God being holy God being you know because there's just so much of that but there's one phrase that comes up and you don't you don't have to turn there but in Isaiah 47 and, and, and a lot of Isaiah and, and, and the, the prophets specifically there's a reference to the Holy One of Israel the Holy One of Israel the Holy One of Israel is going to come the Holy One of Israel which I believe is a reference of Jesus Christ. I think it's pretty clear that that's talking about Jesus Christ, which, who is God, God in the flesh. And Isaiah 47, 4 says, As our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, is His name, the Holy One of Israel. So it's talking about our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, the Holy One of Israel. It's calling God the Holy One. And then how about this? How about just the Holy Ghost? How many times do you see that? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. You've got all aspects, and, and I brought this up when we started going through the characteristics of God. They apply to all three persons of the Godhead. When you talk about the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, they all have these, they, each one of them possess every single one of these characteristics that we're talking about. So, um, and that's evident and very clear when we're talking about holiness. You've got the Holy Ghost, you've got the Holy One of Israel, and you've got the Lord whose name is holy, right? I mean, it's easily demonstrated that this is a quality that's possessed, uh, which makes sense because they're all God. So I have a tendency, I'm going to be speaking in, t as God in general, right? But, but it's very clear from Scripture that the holiness applies uh, all throughout. Now, um, and again, in Isaiah 57, 15, you don't have to turn there. Uh, flip over, if you would, to... Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10. Isaiah 57, 15 says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God's name is holy. We get that over and over again in Scripture as well. In Matthew 6, we've got the Lord's Prayer, right? Right? He says in verse 9, After this manner pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And when something is hallowed, it's made holy. That's what that word means. When, it's, when you're saying his name is hallowed, it's holy. So, um, again, and I don't want to belabor the point on that because we can just spend all morning going through and reading scriptures that talk about God's name being holy, the place where God is being holy, the temple being holy, there's the holiest of holies, there's all these things that are separated and made holy for God and part of who God is. But let's get a better understanding as well. I started off giving you some, 
some words and some synonyms to try to help describe holiness. But look at Leviticus chapter number 10. We're going to see here another, another illustration, some other words used to help us understand uh, what the Bible is talking about with, with God being holy and what it means to be holy. Because holiness is also one of those attributes that we are supposed to share with God, that God is expecting us to have in our life. Vengeance is not an attribute that we ought to have. That is something that belongs solely unto God. Now, God is inherently holy, but he also, because he is holy, demands us to be holy as well. So this is a very important characteristic for us to learn because we need to be applying this in our life. We need to be setting ourselves apart in a way that would, would um, uh, mirror God being set apart and, and holy. And Leviticus chapter 10, we'll, we'll, we're going to start in, in the book of Leviticus, we're going to start to get a, a little bit of an understanding of, of how we can be holy and what it means to be holy. Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean and that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. And what the Bible is teaching us here, he says to Aaron and the priest saying, you know what, when you go into the tabernacle, when you go into the service of the Lord, he says, you better not have been drinking booze. You better not have been drinking wine, strong drink. You better not have been drinking these things because otherwise you're going to die. And the reason why is because God is so serious. You're going to enter into the holy place. Well, holy means it's set apart. Okay. You might go off and do some other things in the world. He says, but when you come into my house, when you come into my place, this place is holy. It's holy. And if you come in and try to defile the holy place of the Lord, you will die. And this is a great passage as well, because it shows how serious God is about alcohol and booze, calling it unclean. It's unclean. It's unholy. It is not something that any Christian or anybody should be participating in, but definitely not if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Leave that stuff alone. Have nothing to do with it. Why? Because it's unholy. And we'll see in a minute that you're called to holiness. You are called to be uh, uh, living in a way that's going to make your life holy. And the whole point of God putting that part, he says, there needs to be a difference. You can't just come in here and, and drink alcohol and just, just treat it like, like this place is like any other place. There's a difference between the clean and the unclean. There's a difference between the holy and the unholy. And we see, you'll see this, the, the reference as you study out holiness and cleanliness are kind of together because it's just showing you like things that are unholy, that it's unclean. It's, 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 um, the two go hand in hand. And cleanliness not meaning like you get some dirt on your hand, but just being like spiritually clean. Um, flip over to chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse number 44. Now, these phrases also are going to appear in the New Testament. And we'll see those kind of at the end of the, the sermon. This is a command that goes across old, both Old and New Testament when it comes to being holy. Verse number 44, Leviticus chapter 11, the Bible reads, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourself. Sanctify means you're setting apart. You shall sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. So this is God telling them, you know what? You need to live different. You need to be a peculiar people. You need to be set apart. You need to be sanctified and be holy because I'm holy. And if you're a child of God, hey, God's holy. You need to be set apart. You need to be holy too. And this is what he's commanding the children of Israel. I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves. So being defiled means you're unholy. You're unclean, right? 
That's, uh, that's what it means to defile yourself with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So specifically here, he's, he's referring to, you know, eating these, these, you know, the dietary restrictions that were in place at the time. And he's saying, you know what? I need you to be separate. I need you to be different. And, and you're going to have to follow these laws. And that's going to make you different. Look at verse number 45. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. He reiterates the same exact phrase. You need to be holy because I'm holy. Verse 46, this is the law of the beasts and of the fowl and of every living creature that moveth in the waters and of every creature that creepeth upon the earth to make a difference between the unclean and the clean. So again, we see that reference there with the uncleanliness, the cleanliness, and between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. Flip over to chapter 19. Actually, just go to chapter 20. Chapter 19, again, we just see another, another illustration in chapter 19. It says, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. I mean, just, just over and over and over again, you're going to find that. Again, Old Testament, New Testament. We'll get to the New Testament verses a little bit later. Um, Leviticus chapter 20, though. Many of you probably are familiar with Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20 is a portion of God's law that goes through all of these commandments and all these things that people can do that are worthy of death. A lot of abominable things, but specifically you run through a whole list of things that are worthy of the death penalty. So it's a very serious passage here. But let's start reading here in verse number 1. The Bible reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in, er in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man, and will cut him off from among his people, because he hath given of his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. So right off the bat, we're, talking, we're seeing people who are defiling God's sanctuary, God's holy place, by offering up their children unto these false gods. And he's saying, my, place, my sanctuary is holy. You don't go and do some wicked, perverted things like that in my house. And if you do, you're dying. That's a death penalty. Because God has no tolerance for this infringement on his holiness. Because God, God, in order for God to remain and be holy, he needs to just be completely, you know, like, like any infringement is cut off. It's just not allowed, not tolerated. Not for a minute. In order to be holy, God cannot be tolerant of anything that defiles an uncleanliness. And that's the way things operate in heaven. There is nothing that defiles in, in, in God's house in the presence of the Lord. Let's keep reading here. Verse number four. And if the people of the land do anyways hide their eyes from the man when he giveth of his seed unto Molech and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off and all that go a-whoring after him to commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a-whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Look at verse 7. Sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy for I am the Lord your God and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. So he's saying, sanctify yourself, set yourselves apart. Now, how do you do that? How do you set yourselves apart? By following the commandments of the Lord. That's how you do it. That's how you, are, you know, can be holy. Obviously, so again, let me, let me step back for a minute because I always want to make sure I'm clear about this. I'm pretty sure that you guys understand what I'm talking about and you're probably already firm on this. There's two different Levels, I guess you could say, I don't want to call them levels of, of being holy. One is your righteousness you receive through Jesus Christ, just being saved. You're sanctified, you're made a saint through your faith in Jesus Christ. His blood cleanses you, washes away your sin, and, and his righteousness is imputed unto you. Okay, so that's, that's one way of speaking about holiness and sanctification is through Jesus Christ alone, right? Just, just through faith in him that cleanses you and washes you and separates you unto God. But there's a, there's a dual meaning with all of this stuff. 
And there's one in which just the way that you live your life, because while we're still in this flesh, while we're still in the body, we have a choice to either be walking in the new man or walking in the flesh, walking in the old man. And God has called us to walk in the spirit and to walk in that holiness. So it's, it, you know, it's not really our holiness, but we have to be walking in that holiness. So when he says to be sanctified and the way we do that, again, it's, it's by doing right. When you're sinning, you're in the flesh. When you're obeying God and obeying his commandments, you're in the spirit. So you see how these are kind of tied together. I'm not trying to make it sound like you're achieving some holiness before God through your works of, that's going to give you your self-righteousness. So I just want to make sure we're clear on that. I'm pretty sure you guys are, but um, it's, it's worth mentioning and bringing up. Walking in the holiness, being set apart is, is the way that we realize that and see that is through God's word, God's commandment, and, and following that and obeying that. And this is why he says, he's, he's talking about being sanctified, being holy, and then saying right after that, keep my statutes and do them. Because they're tied together. Being holy and, and, and doing that is tied in with keeping his statutes. Then through, through most of this chapter, it's going to go on and talk about other people who deserve a death penalty. I'm not going to go through all that this morning. Jump down to verse number 22. Verse number 22, you shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them that the land, whether I bring you to dwell therein, spew you not out. And you shall not walk in the manners of the nation, which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. So just right there when he's saying, I've separated you, he's sa separated, is like sanctified, and he's calling them unto holiness to set them apart from other people. Verse 25, you shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean, between unclean fowls and clean, and you shall not make your souls abominable by beast or by fowl or by any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. Verse 26, and ye shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy and have severed you from other people that ye should be mine. Now, I'm, I've kind of spent a lot of time in Leviticus chapter 20 showing you how the tie-in with holiness and keeping his commandments is there because when we get to the New Testament of reiterating, be ye holy for I am holy, how are we going to do that? Well, we get the instruction from the Old Testament and Leviticus 20, which modern day Christians want to just throw out the window and have nothing to do with at all because it steps on the toes of the, the, the alphabet animals, the sodomites, the LGBTQ, ABC, HIV, you know, God haters. I refer to them as alphabet animals because they're dogs. And that is what, you know, people don't want to read Leviticus 2013. They don't want to hear about it. Not in today's society, but Leviticus 20 is the one that's teaching us how to be holy. So when you see in the New Testament, be ye holy, for I am holy, well, how are we going to do that? Well, let's look back at Leviticus chapter 20. And we'll get an idea of how to be holy. Now, I want to bring up, since we're on the subject of holiness, we're talking about God's holiness, we're talking about us being holy, there's a movement, I don't think it's quite as popular as it used to be, but there's definitely still around. There's a Pentecostal movement, the holiness movement. Have any of you ever heard about the, the holiness crowd or the holy rollers? It was called like, like these days, people might call you a holy roller just because you talk about God or you talk about the Bible, right? But the holy rollers is a term that literally came from the Pentecostal movement where people would, you know, when they would speak in tongues, and they'd start getting demon possessed and they'd start rolling around on the ground and being controlled by other spirits in their in their satanic church service. They would be called holy rollers because they were rolling on the ground in church. 
That's where the term comes from. And there's this movement, it's called the holiness movement of these Pentecostals that believe in sinless perfection. So they actually believe, see, like we believe we should be holy. We should separate ourselves unto God. We should follow the commandments. We should do, you know, everything we can to become holy. The only holiness we truly have comes through Jesus Christ, but we need to be walking in the spirit, trying to try and obey his commandments. But we know that we're going to fall short. But we still strive for that holiness, strive to do what's right. But there are people who actually believe that you can, while you're on this earth, just be sinlessly perfect. I've talked to people like this at the door. They are the most puffed up and lifted up in their own mind people that you'll run into. The people who think they don't do anything wrong, yeah, you better believe they're going to be really proud people. I mean, think about that. If, you just, if you're just like, man, I'm just doing everything right. I'm just, man, I, I wake up in the morning and I read my Bible and I pray and I do not sin and I go to bed and I wake up the next day and I've talked to people who are like, well, when, when's the last time you've sinned? Oh, I don't know, maybe a couple years. I mean, literally, like, these are answers that people are saying. You want to talk about deceiving your own selves. They say they haven't sinned in maybe a couple of years. Some people say eh, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. I don't know. Really? Yeah, but they're, they're really lifted up. See, God is holy and God is exalted and God is lifted up. And that's deserving of the Lord because his name is holy. His name is reverend. He's the creator. He's God. We're not. We're human. We're the creature, the creation. We ought not to be that lifted up. But this movement, it's so easy to refute this concept of being, you know, of people thinking they're just sinlessly perfect and they're without sin. 1 John chapter 1, you can turn if you want, or you could, you know, rather just turn to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. I'll read 1 John chapter 1, the last three verses of the chapter, 1 John chapter 1. It's a great place if you don't already know it or have it memorized or, or at least um, have it marked down. People who think that, that they just don't sin. 1 John chapter 1 is a great place to show them. I'll read verses 8, 9, and 10 for you. The Bible reads, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So you're telling me that you have no sin? You're a liar. You're deceiving yourself, but you know what? More than that, I know that the truth is not in you. You're going to sit there and tell me that you're sinlessly perfect. The truth is not in you. That's what God's word says. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That's what the Bible says. That's what God's word says. Don't go around saying, oh, I, I haven't sinned. I'm not a sinner. You liar. But Romans chapter 7 also teaches us this important concept too. You know, I wish these people would, would actually just read the Bible and think. Now, the reason why they can't is just, the Bible says that the natural man receiveth not the things of God. These people are not saved. They think they can lose their salvation. They think their righteousness is what's actually getting them into heaven. That's why they, you know, we have to be sinlessly perfect. And then when they sin, they say, well, I've got to ask God for forgiveness. And, and then I'm saved again. And, and then they continue on. But they, they believe you have to be perfect. So let's take verses like, well, if you die in your sins, you know, so all people die in their sins as not understanding the forgiveness of sins that you receive when you put your faith in Christ that applies to all time. It's not like after you receive the, the forgiveness of sins, but then you sin again, that you're dying in your sin. You're not dying in your sins. You're dying in Christ. Once you've received Christ, at any moment you physically die after that, you're dying in Christ. You are in Christ because Christ has come inside of you. You've received Christ. Dying in your sins means you have no forgiveness of your sins because you've never received the, the, the sacrifice. You've never received eternal life. 
And that's what dying of sin is. But see, they, just like all false religions and false prophets and false doctrines, they, uh, they really have no understanding of Scripture. But the Scripture teaches us, even the, the Apostle Paul, you know, these people could just look at the Apostle Paul's example. I, I don't know. I don't know if any of these people, I haven't, I don't think I've, you don't run across these people a whole lot. I've run into one out here since I've been soul winning. It's, like I said, it's not as big of a movement as it used to. It used to be a bigger movement in like the 60s and the 70s. And, and now I think it's kind of faded away just because it's so, hopefully, because people realize how ridiculous it is. And that you're really just deceiving yourselves. I mean, your average person on the street, 99.9% .9 of the people you run into have no problem admitting that they're a sinner. Saying, yeah, I make mistakes. Yeah, I do things that are wrong. Yeah, do you know anyone who's perfect? No, I don't. I don't know anyone who's perfect. You know, even your loving grandma, is she perfect? No. You may love her a lot. She may be a real sweet lady, but she's not perfect. Right? And people are fine admitting that. The vast majority of people, but those that just cannot accept that, they are really lifted up and full of themselves and just deceiving themselves and want to make themselves think that they're that good and think that they deserve heavens. And those are going to be the holier-than-thou people as well. Because they look down their nose thinking that they're so great and holy and special, and you're not. And it's that pride and arrogance that comes across when people start to view themselves as just being super holy. Now look, we're called to holiness. We should be striving to be holy, but don't allow that to get to your head to start thinking, wow, I'm really holy. <laughs> so then you start looking down on other people, right? It's, it's, we need to remain humble while we're striving for, for the holiness that God's called us unto. Romans chapter 7, look at verse number 14. The Bible reads, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Now, the Apostle Paul of all people, are you going to compare yourself to somebody and, and the amount of work that he's doing and, and the holiness that he exhibited after his conversion and, and all that he did for the Lord? How many people are willing to just say, you know what, I'll stack myself up against the Apostle Paul because I'm doing way more than he did and I'm just a much better Christian than he is? You'd be a fool to just, to just boast of yourself that way when we read about all the things that the Apostle Paul did and went through and, and just all of his works. He's a great example and a great leader, someone to look to as, 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 some, as someone to emulate in the faith, right? But even the Apostle Paul in his epistle to the Romans, what we're reading here in Romans chapter 7, He's saying, I am carnal, sold under sin. As much holiness as he may have achieved to just through his own obedience and following God's law and walking in the Spirit, he's still saying, look, I'm sold under sin. Verse 15, for that which I do, I allow not. He's saying, I don't, I'm doing things, I end up doing things that like, I have rules against, right? That, that I don't allow for myself, but I do them. That which I do I allow not for what I would, which means what I want, that do I not. He said, the things I really want to do, I, I, so I just find myself not ending up doing those things. And then the things that I don't want to do and I'm making those rules, I end up doing those things. He says, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. He said, if I end up doing the things that I don't want to do, but I still end up doing them, hey, the law is still the law. The law is still good. Whether you wanted to do it or not, that doesn't change the law. The law is good. He says, now then, in verse 17, now then there's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. And this is where he's very careful to, to identify what he's talking about. We get some really clear information about how we are composed, what, what we're made of, because he says, on one hand, he says, it's no more I to do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. The reason he says that is not to absolve himself of any responsibility. That's not the point. He's not saying, well, it just wasn't me anyway, so who cares? No, what he's doing is explaining how we are composed as believers, that we have a spirit, the new man, and we also have the flesh, which is the old man. So 
as he clarifies, he says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. He says, no good thing in my flesh. So when he's talking about me, he's referring to his flesh. He's not referring to the inward man. He's not referring to the spirit because in the spirit, there are things that are good that dwells in the spirit, in the new man. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3 that, that the, whatsoever is born of God doth not commit sin. So that new man is perfect. That new man is sinless, but we are made up of body, soul, and spirit. So our body, in our flesh, there is no good thing in there. Our flesh is just draws us to sin. But the inward man, the spirit, is what we should be trying to walk in instead of in our flesh uh, to do what's good. So he says here, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. He's saying, well, my will is still present, right? I still could choose. But how to do that which is good, he says, still, but trying to choose the right way, I'm, you know, I'm still struggling. I still find his... Now, look, does this just mean he's never doing anything right? No. But he's, he's bringing up this, this problem that all people have. All human beings have a problem with sin. Because nobody is perfect. There is not a day that goes by that a person doesn't struggle in one way or another with their sin. At least if you're born again, it's a struggle because you've got the spirit, but you've got the flesh. For people who aren't saved, it's not as much of a struggle, although they may, they may still do things they don't want to do, right? But the struggle with the, with the believer is the spirit versus the flesh. And even the Apostle Paul is saying that he still finds himself not being able to, even though he has the choice. And that's why he says, to will, for the will is present with me. He's not absolving himself. He's not just saying the flesh just takes over and I have no control. He's saying that the will is still there, but I'm still having a problem choosing the right path and doing what's right all the time. Uh, verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And this is where he brings up the inward man. He say, hey, I love God's law. The inward man loves God's law. I love the commandments. I, it's my delight. It's what I want to do. But I see another law in my members. His members meaning his flesh, his body. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And this, for this very reason, is why it's just simply not possible to be sinlessly perfect while we're still in this flesh. And, and, it's, and it's written out very well there in Romans chapter 7, just describing this, this conflict, this battle that we have, and the fact that even the Apostle Paul couldn't always just choose to do right 100% of the time. And if you're going to look at examples, and, and great men of God, he's a great example, and even he couldn't do it. So how haughty and proud is it for you to think that you could just be completely sinlessly perfect? There's no way. The Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. The thought. A thought. There's a thought. That's it. The Bible says that to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Amen. So you can't just go and lock yourself up in a monastery somewhere and just try to isolate yourself from the whole world and say, well, I'm not going to sin because how can I sin if I'm just just locked myself in a box in a, in a corner somewhere and just in the, in the remote part of the world, how can I sin, right? Do you think I'm, I'm going to remove all temptations? That's sinning. Because <laughs> if you know to do good, hey, how are you supposed to be helping other people and doing things for other people and preaching the gospel of the world and doing all the work that God has for you to do and do good when you do it not? That's a sin. 
So you can't just isolate yourself. You have to be in this world, but not of this world. You have to be part of things that's going to appeal to your flesh while you're trying to walk in the Spirit, and nobody can always choose to be in the Spirit all the time. It's just not possible. I wish it were. The Apostle Paul wished it was. But one day we have hope. We have something to look forward to. When this flesh is gone, when this flesh is changed, then we will be sin. Then we'll, then we'll understand what it's like to be always in the Spirit. And to not have the body of this death that we reside in. And what a day that will be. Romans chapter 12, just flip over a couple pages. Romans chapter 12. We're going to close with this, I, 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 with these last few passages. I've got a few passages now in the New Testament. Because we looked a lot in the Old Testament. We looked at the holiness of God. And God's called us unto holiness. But look what the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, the Bible's teaching us that we need to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. And that's reasonable. That's, that's your reasonable service. That's not going above and beyond. Think about that. Your entire body. He's saying, you should be offering your body up as a sacrifice to God. You should be willing to sacrifice yourself. And that's not some great thing. That's just reasonable. Now, why is that reasonable? Well, maybe because Jesus Christ gave himself for you when you didn't deserve it at all. And that God loves you so much that he's willing to give you this free gift and give you eternal life and pardon all of your sins. Yeah, maybe that has something to do with it just being reasonable then for you to say, hey, I owe you everything. So here, what I'm going to do, God, I'm going to just offer myself up to you since, since you bought and paid for everything. And without you, I would just be burning in hell. Thank you. I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, do what I can and just offer up myself to you. And this is not a commandment for, oh, well, you're called to pastor a church, so you're going to give yourself a living sacrifice. No, that's not what this is talking about. This is every believer has a reasonable service of offering up themselves a living sacrifice. Now, it doesn't, it, you know, pastoring a church isn't the only way of serving God. That's not, that's not the only sacrifice that's, that's there, right? But what you do with your life and your time, however that is in your service to God, he's saying that's reasonable. And how do he says, present yourself a living sacrifice, holy. So if you're going to present a, a sacrifice unto God, it needs to be holy. And going back to some of the holiness attributes, it's, you know, the Bible talks about people who would bring sacrifices that were lame and, and had broken bones and they were not the best of the flock. You know, is that something that God's going to accept? And this is where the people got to, where they just started, instead of choosing either the best or just not, you know, specifically doing it, there, there, there's different requirements for the different sacrifices of the Old Testament, and I don't want to get too deep into all that. But... What people ended up doing was, oh, well, if, if, if I have to give to God, I'm just going to pick out the bad ones anyways. But think of how wicked that is. You're giving a sacrifice. It's like, well, we've got, we've got to give something to God here. We've got to give something so those Levites can eat. But here, you know, yeah, this one's lame. This one's sterile. This one's not going to do me any good. So, oh, here you go. I've satisfied my tithe. I've satisfied what I'm supposed to give. Here's your sacrifice. That's wicked. That's not holy. When the sacrifices were being offered, because it's a sacrifice, right. right? You're sacrificing something. It ought to be something that, one, the person you're giving it to is worthy. God is holy. So don't you think the sacrifice you give should be holy also? I mean, a sacrifice that was made for us, Jesus Christ, was holy. He was perfect, and that's why these sacrifices needed to be holy because they're representative of picturing Jesus Christ. But if you are becoming that sacrifice, 
If you are offering yourself up now to be that, because we're not doing the animal sacrifices anymore, but now he's saying, well, how about you just offer up yourself a living sacrifice? You should be holy. You should be, that's why he says, be not conformed to this world. You need to be separated from this world. Because all that's in the world is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And that's going to be, that's where your uncleanness comes from. That's going to make you unholy. We need to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God that can make you that holy, living sacrifice unto God. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Which is in 1 Peter, I'll just, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 13, I'm going to close on this passage. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Separating yourselves from, look, in the past you might have been into these various sins, doing this, doing that. He's saying, we're not fashioning ourselves according to that. When you were ignorant, when you didn't know these things were sins, when you didn't, you didn't know the truth, you didn't know about God's word, you didn't know the commandments, we're not going back to that. He's saying in verse 15, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. Reiterated in the New Testament and very clearly telling us being holy means getting out the sin, staying away from that, being separate. God is holy. God is pure. God is true. God is righteous. God is set apart above all of these things. That's an attribute of God. That is who God is. God is so holy. He has angels in heaven. He's got creatures just proclaiming the holiness of God to exalt his name and his name alone. And he has called on us Hey, with all that God is, with all that our holy God has done for us, why don't you present yourselves, your bodies, a living sacrifice unto God, and make that sacrifice holy? That's what's called on us to do. Spot rise, I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us to know so much about you through your word. God, thank you for revealing that unto us. Help us to understand more and more about who you are and also what, what you would have for us to do. We, we know that we have your words, and I pray that you please help us to lose our ignorance. Give us wisdom and knowledge and, and help us to understand the right way. Help us to become more holy, Lord, and, um, and to identify the areas that are unclean and unholy in our lives so that we can correct them and that we can fix them uh, as you would have us to do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.